I know that we're talking about the Muppets here, but I'm just saying, don't be surprised if some will get upset that you're skipping out or not fully talking about some of the significant non-Muppet Jim Henson stuff. I mean, you're on the internet, you know how comments can be. I'm just putting out a warning for you and, oh! <laughs> The 1970s were the golden era of the Muppets. Sesame Street was off to a great start as it began its legacy as the greatest preschool show in television history. But at the same time, while also producing a variety of TV specials, Jim Henson was slowly building his masterpiece that would ultimately make the Muppets the icons we know them today. He spent years pitching and developing a series for an older audience, but it was definitely no easy task, especially with the fame of Sesame Street turning into an obstacle, and how, well, some attempts failed pretty mucking badly like on Saturday Night Live. It wouldn't be until 1976, when all of Jim and his team's hard work finally paid off with the premiere of The Muppet Show. And as more episodes and seasons get released over time, Kermit, along with his new friends Miss Piggy, Fozzie, Gonzo, and more, were able to accomplish Jim's mission of making the Muppets entertaining for both kids and adults, on top of the Muppet Show becoming one of the most popular television series of its time. However, their fame did not stop there. During the middle of the show's production, Jim and Kermit took a major leap into the movie business to create their first feature film, The Muppet Movie. The success of that picture propelled their popularity even further, where the Muppets proved that they could dominate both the big and small screen, and that they could be as famous as the guest stars who come to the show. But then came 1981, which was a bittersweet year for both fans and the team. Yes, it was sad to see the beloved series come to an end, but everyone knew that it wouldn't be the last that they would see Kermit and the gang. In fact, that statement proved to be true just around a month after the airing of the final episode, as the colorful characters returned to theaters for the great Muppet caper. In this movie, Kermit and Fozzie are identical twin reporters, accompanied by their photographer, Gonzo. As they head to London to crack the case of the stolen jewels that belong to fashion designer Lady Holiday, Kermit falls in love with the lady's new receptionist, Miss Piggy. But with the real thieves now plotting to go and steal Holiday's most prized possession, the baseball diamond, it's up to the trio and their new friends that they met at the rundown Happiness Hotel to catch them red-handed. Yeah. Yes, Bo? What color are their hands now? <laughs> While he was working on both The Muppet Show and Sesame Street, Jim Henson was developing bit by bit a concept for a fantasy feature that would be unlike any of his past creations that he then called The Crystal. Instead of a colorful and comical cast that fills the screen with enjoyable mayhem, this would have a darker and more serious tone with both majestic and intimidating characters and creatures that inhabit the world, all brought to life by fantasy illustrator Brian Froud. It's almost like if the Land of Gorge was not funny. On purpose. It would be his most ambitious project after the Muppets, especially when the puppets planned for it would be far more advanced than what the team would create for the Muppet Show. As he was ready to pitch the picture to Paramount, he was sure that they would be happy to make his movie after leading the massive success of both the Muppet Show and movie. But one look at the weird designs that seemed nothing like Kermit and the gang and that was enough for those executives to say no. Okay, um, time for plan B, which is to pitch the movie to the man who made the Muppet Show and movie possible, Lord Lou Grade. However, just before he was able to talk to Lou, Jim's friend and producer, David Laser, had a talk with him. He told him that, unfortunately, his chances of Grade approving the crystal were not as strong as he thought. But then again, he had a plan that could get him to say yes to his passion project. Instead of just pitching the movie to him, Laser would sell him a two-for-one deal. 
Along with the crystal, Jim would also create a sequel to the Muppet movie and would work on that first before getting into the other film. As it turned out, the plan actually worked, and Lou Grade greenlit both movies with the Muppet sequel getting a $14 million budget and the crystal receiving $13 million. Jim was honestly disappointed that he would have to delay his ambitious feature just to make another Muppet project, but he was at least happy that he did get his opportunity to make his Crystal film. For the second Muppet movie, Jim had some ideas in his mind, but not enough to fully develop an entire picture with. He knew that he wanted the film to be a tribute to movie musicals from the early days of Hollywood, and Kermit would play a reporter turned detective who was trying to win Miss Piggy's love along with a finale that would maybe involve a chase and a final song where all the Muppets sing while gently floating down in parachutes. For Jerry Jewell and writer Jack Rose, they turned those vague ideas into a script, but Henson was privately unsatisfied with what they've done. That's why he later brought in the TV filmmaking duo Tom Pachette and Jay Tarsis who previously worked on the shows of Bob Newhart, Carol Burnett, and Tony Randall to help him improve the script and managed to deliver him a first draft that he could work with by May of 1980. At the same time, he hired some people to join the team so that they can work on additional elements for the picture, despite having no clue what to do with them and not having a complete story ready, such as Anita Mann to be the choreographer of possible dance sequences, and Sesame Street songwriter Joe Raposo to prepare him for creating the musical numbers. Now all that's left for the script is to give it a good title. Pachetta and Tarsus did provide one with their draft called Muppet Mania, but Jim wasn't too fond of that and asked his team if they could provide some better suggestions. They came up with some pretty wild ideas like A Froggy Day in London and The Rocky Muppet Picture Show. But it was one of Jim's daughters, Lisa, who came up with a title that caught his attention where she wrote down The Great Muppet Capade. He also noticed other words that she crossed off for the title like Escapade and Caper. So, with a few adjustments, Jim finally found the title of his next Muppet movie as The Great Muppet Caper. Nice title. The only position that would be left to fill was the director. While he was more eager to helm his Crystal movie, Jim decided to have this be his directorial debut, since it would be a safe start to work with what he's most familiar with to gather some experience so that he could be more prepared for the Crystal, which makes The Great Muppet Caper his first and only Muppet feature that he ever directed. Just like the Muppet movie, this film is noted for innovating the technical achievements in puppetry with several standout moments, including the first scene the team filmed, the Couldn't We Ride number. As I talked about before, one of the most acclaimed effects in the Muppet movie was when Kermit was riding a bicycle. And after hearing all the praise for that effect, Jim decided to give audiences something bigger by not just having Kermit ride a bike, but have all the Muppets on a bike at the same time. With the help of Jim's son, Brian Henson and Foz Fazakis, they used a combination of remote controls, rods, and marionette rings to present them, all simultaneously riding on Battersea Park, while two big tricycles that are connected to all the bikes lead the way, which can be seen way ahead by the end of the song. But riding bikes had already been done several times before, Muppets actually performing underwater, on the other hand, is something that no one had ever seen at the time. As part of his homage to early film musicals, one idea Jim really wanted to do since the beginning of production was to have an underwater ballet sequence inspired by the works of swimmer and actress Esther Williams. Even before filming the scene, Muppet designer Carolee Wilcox and her team in the New York Muppet Workshop spent weeks trying to figure out how to build a Miss Piggy puppet that can be used underwater. While not entirely successful in making one that's completely waterproof, the team created almost 40 heads and 7 bodies that can be interchangeable after every shot, along with Piggy with a remote controlled head and a full body costume for the final shot when she dives down into the pool. Oh, speaking of that pool, that was another major thing that the team built for that one scene. In a huge soundstage, they had to build a pool that was 80 feet long, 
50 feet wide and 8 feet deep. All with water that was kept at 80 degrees Fahrenheit to make sure that everyone was comfortable. Oh, and did I forget to mention that this was the same soundstage that was used in The Empire Strikes Back when Luke had his big confrontation with Darth Vader? Oh, don't worry, by the way. Uh, I will talk more about the connection of that film and Jim Henson a little later. But first, back on to Piggy's Fantasy. As for Miss Piggy's performance, the pool was built to help out Frank Oz and the other swimmers as much as possible with monitors at the bottom to show what he was doing with Piggy, and speakers so that everyone's movements underwater can sync with the music. Also, Frank was provided a wetsuit that's the same color as the pool so that he could easily blend in with the background, and a diver with an oxygen tank who would provide him some air through a tube between takes. As for the final shots that were filmed on February of 1981, Jim and his crew went to Albuquerque, New Mexico to film the opening scene with Kermit, Fozzie, and Gonzo on a hot air balloon commenting on the opening credits. Including a gag where Animal eats the logo scenery and we see the trio fly behind him, which was all performed in front of the camera. Other than the close-up shots, everything was remote controlled, from the balloon itself to the Muppets inside, all controlled by Jim, Frank, and Dave Goals in a helicopter. At one point, the balloon did not land correctly after a take, causing the basket to make the Muppets tumble and have Fozzie scorched by the propane burners. Luckily, Amy Van Gilder was there to quickly fix the bear up, and as a little reward for her rescue mission, she earned a credit at the end of the picture as the Muppet Doctor. However, as admirable as those technical achievements are, the most impactful scene for the team was actually this part here. Look, Dad, there's a bear! No, Christine, that's a frog. Bears wear hats. This was a cute little shot Jim included to give a cameo to both Jerry Nelson and his daughter Christine. For years, she had been going through medical complications and sadly passed away of cystic fibrosis in September of 1982. While this may be just a cute joke for some, it was a moment that meant so much for Jerry, and an example of how Jim's small acts of kindness can go a long way. When the caper was caught in theaters on June 26, 1981, the success of the picture was not on par with the Muppet movies, and it was up against some anticipated summer blockbusters like Superman 2 and Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it was still a success nonetheless. While not as praised as his predecessor, Critics still applauded the acting and chemistry of Kermit and Miss Piggy and Jim Henson's directing talent. However, at the box office, it only made less than half of what the Muppet movie did by earning just $31.2 million domestically. Then again, it still received some award recognition, like a nomination for Best Original Song at the Oscars for The First Time It Happens, and Miss Piggy being the first and so far only non-human to win a Youth in Film Award, which she got Best Young Musical Recording Artist for her part in, again, The First Time It Happens. Oh, and did I forget to mention how Piggy herself dazzled critics? You point out how Miss Piggy is really the star of the movie, I agree with you, and I think she's great. Every mm -hmm. time she popped up on the screen, I paid more attention to her and attention to the mm -hmm. film. I'm not saying that because I want to be cute or trendy with Miss Piggy. I'm not even the biggest fan of The Muppet Show. But she is a genuine actress in this film. Mm -hmm. When they flip her upside down, you notice how big her thighs are <laughs> when she has her lines of dialogue and her fantasy. It's interesting. So mm -hmm. I'm recommending the film only for those scenes in which she's on the screen. Sure, this did not end up becoming the next Muppet movie. Well, it technically is, but I mean that figuratively. However, it still did manage to achieve some of those similar goals in its own way. It dazzled audiences with some incredible effects, gave them a new batch of memorable songs, and solidified Kermit, Miss Piggy, and the Muppets as big screen performers in their own right. This may not have been Jim's top priority at the time, but they still took a chance and saw romance and happily in a movie for everybody and me. <laughs> Despite the fact that the Great Muppet Caper was not as big as the Muppet movie, Jim wasn't all that bothered by the results. In a way, the 1980s started a new era in Henson's life where he continued to innovate his craft, but this time 
he became more dedicated than ever to bring them to the big screen. In fact, even before he got to work on either The Crystal or The Great Muppet Caper, Jim and his team were helping a fellow filmmaker from a neighboring studio named George Lucas. At the time, Lucas was working on the Star Wars sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, and he asked Jim to join makeup artist Stuart Freeborn to create a new character called Yoda. As much as he was happy to bring his team on board, hence his schedule was getting too full to have himself get involved which was why he wasn't able to have time to perform the character, and instead, recommended Frank Oz to play the role. It was tough for Oz and the Henson team, since Lucas's people built the puppet with heavy materials and throw in all those wires and mechanisms, but they tried their best to give the franchise one of the most admired Jedi Masters in the galaxy. Or rather, they did their best. After all, Do. Or do not. There is no try. But not only did Jim help George, George also helped Jim, where not long after the filming, he let some of the cast of Star Wars be a guest on one of the season 4 episodes of The Muppet Show, where Luke Skywalker, Chewbacca, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Luke's cousin Mark Hamill all came to be a part of one of the series' most memorable moments. Now I know what we're all thinking here, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves. By the way, would this be considered canon? But more than Yoda and the Muppets, Jim's passion was entirely set on creating his Crystal movie, or as he later gave it the title, The Dark Crystal, which he began filming not long after finishing the shoots for Caper. As both Henson and Oz led the project as directors, Jim's ambitions were not only the driving force of the picture, but they were also the film's biggest obstacle. His ideas were so unconventional and so unusual that not only were they a serious challenge for the crew to develop the puppets of these uniquely fantastical beasts, let alone puppeteering them, but it was tougher to convince the financers to add more funds to the project when they barely could understand what he was making. It also didn't help that Lou Grade's ITC Entertainment Studio, the same that housed The Muppet Show, was sold to Australian businessman Robert Holmes Accord, who had no clue what Jim was making and demanded changes to the film based on poor test screenings. It ended up becoming so bad that it began to clash with Jim's creative vision, which he refused to sacrifice, even just a little bit, resulting in Henson to buy the film from his executives to keep complete creative control for $15 million. When The Dark Crystal came out on December 17, 1982, it didn't reach the phenomenon levels of the Muppets, but it did do decently well on its own. On its initial release, critics and audiences were very mixed about Henson's latest creation. As Brian Henson said it best, people who liked it loved it, but others were not so keen. But it did manage to turn a profit at the box office by making over $40 million domestically and $60 million worldwide. Less than a month later, on January 10th, 1983, a side project of Jim's was released called Fraggle Rock a non-Muppet series that he conceptualized as a show that would end war. Much more than The Dark Crystal, Fraggle Rock was an immediate success, giving the team a new cast of beloved characters to entertain audiences for years to come alongside Sesame Street and The Muppets, and a new series for Henson to include to his already hectic schedule that had him making frequent trips to Toronto to check on the Fraggles. And if that wasn't enough, shortly after the premiere of the show, Jim and Brian Froud started development on another fantasy movie that would be a little more lighthearted and comedic than The Dark Crystal. Meanwhile, as Henson was bringing audiences to brand new worlds, the Muppets were still appearing on television through specials, including the fantastic Miss Piggy show, which featured guest stars like Andy Kaufman, John Ritter, and George Hamilton, and two featuring John Denver, like their first holiday special called John Denver and the Muppets A Christmas Together in 1979, and Rocky Mountain Holiday in 1983. 
However, there was a significant purpose to these specials. They weren't just to keep the Muppets on television after their show was finished, but it was also to keep them relevant in between movies. And while they were singing with Hamilton and Denver on TV, they were also planning their next big screen trip. They already took Hollywood and London in their first two films, but in the third movie, the Muppets take Manhattan. It's the story of the Muppets, this time as college graduates, who decided to take their stage production called Manhattan Melodies to Broadway. However, their mission turned out to be a lot more unsuccessful than they expected, and the gang decided that they would all leave New York City to live on their own. Except for Kermit, who promised them that he'll one day get the show on Broadway and have them all back to be in the cast when that time comes. Now Kermit, along with the help of his new friends at the diner he works at, are doing everything they can to have their show become New York's next big musical. As I mentioned before, Jim's life was busier than ever. With Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock, his next fantasy film, and whatever projects the Muppets find themselves in, he knew that he would have no time to fully commit to working on the next Muppet feature, which began with the simple title of Muppet Movie 3. On a side note, instead of making the Muppets and the Henson team fly off to somewhere far like Hollywood or London, Jeb decided to have the third film be set in New York City, since most of the crew moved back there after the Muppet show so that they could be close to their jobs on Sesame Street. Of course, he would still be involved to perform as his Muppets like Kermit and be an executive producer, but the directing role had to go to someone else. After sharing the director's chair with him on The Dark Crystal, he decided to give his longtime Muppet partner and friend Frank Oz his first solo directing job. It was a big responsibility that he was given, but knowing that this would be a great opportunity to boost his career as a filmmaker, he accepted the role. The first thing he did on the project, with Jim's permission, was to make his own revisions on the script. Written by the same duo from The Great Muppet Caper, Tom Pachet and Jay Tarsus, they gave it the title, The Muppets, The Legend Continues. Frank didn't like how it was, in his own words, way too over-jokey. So he made the drastic change of taking away a lot of the signature Muppet silliness and replaced it with more serious character development. And once pre-production was set, the team headed to New York City to start filming the newly titled Muppets Take Manhattan at the end of May of 1983. It was quite a sight to see the team bringing the cast to life all around the Big Apple, where even the New Yorkers, who got used to seeing film crews working around their block, stopped on their tracks to witness the Muppets at work on their next picture. But while the outside perspective was Kermit and Miss Piggy performing their next big roles, there was a hidden frustration within the team. As Oz was starting to become a director, even when he was sharing his job with Jim, he had a hard time adjusting to his new position and would be very nitpicky to the point of demanding countless of retakes. It annoyed everyone so badly that even Henson himself, known for his calm nature and patience, was getting mad at Frank. Yes, it is true that Oz had a very rough start as a director. However, it is now regarded as a rough start to his illustrious filmmaking career. Also, in Frank's defense, not everything he did on The Muppets Take Manhattan was irritating to the crew. There were some of his contributions that Jim really liked, including how he expanded Kermit's personality. Instead of limiting him to the one trait that he's known for, Oz made him more of a caricature of Jim Henson, playing with how he was a big name producer or a marketer, and he even shows some of Kermit's sides that have been rarely seen, like when he snapped because he was tired of the gang's dependency on him. Yeah, Kermit, what should we do? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I don't know. How should I know? Why are you always asking me anyway? Can't you take care of yourselves? I, I don't know what to do next. We failed, okay? We tried and we failed. As the movie featured several guest stars, as expected from a Muppet movie, there were others that never showed up. 
The list of cameos originally included Michael Jackson, Steve Martin, Laurence Olivier, Richard Pryor, Lily Tomlin, and Dustin Hoffman. The latter was supposed to play a Broadway producer that would be like an imitation of the Godfather producer Robert Evans. However, Hoffman bailed out at the last minute worrying if what he'd do might offend Evans. And once the original batch passed on appearing as well, Oz and special consultant David Mitch made some adjustments to the script to include Joan Rivers, Art Carney, Brooke Shields, Gregory Hines, John Landis, Liza Minnelli, Elliot Gould, and more. I'm sorry, but I have to get a contract so I can go out and kill him. Nah. But more than anything in the film, what really got audiences hyped up for the picture was what they heard about the final scene. A wedding between Miss Piggy and Kermit, to which had 175 puppeteers all performing around 300 Muppets watching the ceremony, including some of the Sesame Street characters in the back and Uncle Traveling Matt in the front with the bears. You see, back in Jim Henson's age, the relationship between the frog and the pig was treated like a real celebrity couple, where people were so fascinated by the highs and lows of their love in both The Muppet Show and in the movies. So once they heard about their third film ending with a wedding scene and that a real minister, Dr. Cyril Jenkins, was presiding, reporters were frantically buzzing around asking the big question of are they married or not? To which Jim, Frank, Kermit, and Miss Piggy were all having fun keeping the answer ambiguous and leaving the reporters completely confused. Well, Did you and Kermit finally do it? I, I cannot say. Oh. Kermit, my little froggy poo is rather private about things like that. We were, we were married in a movie. I was an actor in a movie and I played the part of someone who got married. That doesn't have anything to do with my own personal life and uh, my personal life I prefer to keep personal. Although, it is worth noting that the comic adaptation and a deleted scene for the picture had Gonzo clarifying that the minister was not an actor. Then again, rather if that piece of info would be canon or not is up to you. When the Muppets first presented audiences how they took Manhattan on July 13th, 1984, Oz's first solo film started off strong. Maybe not Muppet movie strong, but like the great Muppet caper, it was a good effort on its own. Critics were not fans of replacing the Muppets' signature comedic chaos with more character development, and the plot is said to be not original, but they do acknowledge that it is still a solid picture as is. It was also well rewarded by earning a domestic total of $25.5 million on an $8 million budget, and received an Oscar nomination for Best Original Score. 35 years after the release, Adam Horowitz and Eddie Kitsis, the creators of the series Once Upon a Time, and Josh Gad originally were developing a six-part limited series that would have been a sequel to The Muppets Take Manhattan called Muppets Live Another Day. According to Gad, it would have been a Stranger Things-style 1980s throwback with songs by Robert and Kristen Anderson Lopez, and the plot would have been about Kermit trying to reunite with the gang in order to find Wolf after he was said to have disappeared. But after the Muppet Studio changed executives, the series was ultimately cancelled due to creative differences. While it may have been the third movie, it was also the first for many in this picture. It was the first time that Frank Oz was able to prove himself that he is a film director, it was the first time that Jim felt comfortable giving someone else creative control of the Muppets, and it was the first time that Kermit and Piggy's relationship made headlines with how their love could be taken to the next level with a ring. And what's more, the team didn't have to travel far to bring the Muppets on their latest big adventure. Their home of Manhattan was already an ideal place as the most popular city where you could put on a show. And that's exactly what the Muppets did. And with Kermit and the gang in New York City, nothing could go wrong because they are right where they belong. But amongst everything that occurred in The Muppets Take Manhattan, more than Oz's solo directorial debut, more than the songs, and more than the wedding itself, there was one little three-minute scene that is considered to be the most impactful moment from the feature. In the middle of the film, as Kermit and Miss Piggy ride on a horse carriage to rekindle their love, 
Piggy asked the frog about what if they knew each other since they were really young. And I mean infant young. Thus starting the dream sequence where all the Muppets are now babies singing the song I'm Gonna Always Love You. It was considered to be one of the most challenging scenes to shoot, especially to film it in the way that the camera doesn't show the Muppet performers' arms and for them to believably control their younger characters with stubby little limbs. However, as Jim and Frank were recording the lyrics of Mama, Dada, Popo, Chihuahua, little did they know that they were developing the next cultural phenomenon that would start a new era for the Muppets. An era where they take on that new form and enter the world of animation to make audiences' dreams come true. Yes, not even Jim Henson himself would expect that his next powerhouse was Muppet Babies. In the series, the Muppets are all babies in a nursery, supervised by a woman named Nanny. In every episode, the babies use their imagination to pretend that they're in all kinds of scenarios, rather it be finding themselves in a fantasy world or in an epic adventure. Sometimes, their imagination can help them solve problems or confronting childhood moments that everyone goes through. But regardless of where their imagination takes them, they always make sure that they go through it together. After the release of The Dark Crystal, Jim Henson's company was entering a new phase where they were becoming their own independent studio. When Lord Lou Grade sold his company, Jim immediately went to buy off the rights to all of his works that he did with Grade, including The Muppet Show, the first two movies, all of their specials, The Dark Crystal, and The Muppets themselves for a total of $21.5 million. 15 million of which, as I said before, was for the Dark Crystal alone. It was a big price to pay, but it was more than worth it in the long run to give him complete control over his creations and how they are presented to the world. He always wanted to make sure that there was a certain standard that was met before the Muppets would present themselves on it, and that was especially the case with their early merchandising where Jim was involved with carefully inspecting each one before they would get his approval. However, by the time that Henson became much busier with all of his movies and shows during the 1980s, he became less strict and allowed more merch to have the Muppets' faces on them, since they helped generate a lot of profit to fund Jim's more ambitious projects. When marketers first heard that Henson was introducing baby versions of his characters, they immediately jumped to the opportunity to make Muppet Babies products for young families that flew off the shelves months before the Muppets Take Manhattan premiered. But amongst all those products, there was one proposal that Henson received that took him off guard. To turn the Muppet Babies into a Saturday morning cartoon. And it came from the most unexpected team. Avengers! Assemble. No! <laughs> oh, um, this? Yeah, um, this isn't a cute joke or anything like that. This is just to say that it was Marvel that wanted to do that Muppet Babies cartoon. And yes, I do mean that. Marvel. <sighs> okay, um, you're gonna need to sit down for this one because there is a lot to explain. You see, Marvel was not the legendary Disney division that we know them today. In fact, they were an entirely different company back in the 1980s. At the time, Marvel was all about the comics. Now, I know some may say that they still are today, yes, but what I mean is that most of what Marvel was doing and what people thought about when they heard the name was the comics and the comics alone. Even if there were a few notable adaptations at the time, like the animated Spider-Man series of the 1960s and the Incredible Hulk with Lou Ferrigno. However, in 1981, Marvel decided to expand the company with an animation studio called Marvel Productions. Of course, they made a few animated shows based on their comics, like Spider-Man and Hulk, but what the studio was mostly known for was their collaborations with Hasbro to create some of the most well-known animated series of the 80s, like Transformers, My Little Pony, Jam and the Holograms, and G.I. Joe. 
While it is very unexpected that the original Muppet Baby series has a direct link with Marvel, even I was surprised at that, but even they knew back then that these babies had a lot of potential. At first, Jim was a bit skeptical with the idea of bringing the Muppets to Saturday mornings, since those don't hold as much educational value as Sesame Street, and it might reverse the public perception of the Muppets as entertainment for everyone by putting them in a time slot that is geared more for kids. However, after careful consideration, Jim realized that he could still move forward with the project and make something that could have it stand out from all the other cartoons. And so, Jim Henson and Marvel agreed to produce the series, with Henson Associates keeping quality control with Fraggle Rock's Michael Frith and Loris Merkin as creative consultants, and Marvel Productions to be in charge of the production, like with writing and animating, which the latter would be provided by their frequent collaborator, the Japanese studio Toei Animation. To have the series be more meaningful in its existence, Henson and Marvel agreed to implement a core theme of the power of creativity, to encourage viewers to use their imagination and open up to other people's creative ideas to help solve problems and go through life in a way that is more fun and enjoyable. As he was aware that scheduling can be a very tricky obstacle, Jim decided that not only would he not reprise his roles for the show, but the same went to the other Muppet performers, as they would be too busy with other projects like Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock, and whatever Muppet specials that could come up. That's why the team decided to hire a fresh voice cast to play the Muppets, many of whom are now known as voice acting veterans, including Frank Welker as Baby Kermit, Laurie O'Brien as Baby Piggy, Greg Berg as both Baby Fozzie and Baby Scooter, Katie Lang as Baby Rolf, Rusi Taylor as Baby Gonzo, and Howie Mandel as Baby Animal and a new character named Baby Skeeter, Scooter's athletic sister. In some episodes, other young Muppets get invited as guests like Bunsen and Beaker, voiced by Mandel and Welker respectively, Robin, voiced by Taylor, and from season 7 onward, there also were Bean Bunny, Janice, and Statler and Waldorf. One notable aspect about Muppet Babies is how the kids find themselves in clips of movies, shows, and stock footage, some of which are highly well known. Not only was this to give the show a unique visual aspect with the cartoon babies traveling around live action worlds, but it was also to save costs on animation cells. In an interview with the Movin' Right Along podcast, Michael Frith said, Here we got this potential of these libraries of existing footage that cost almost nothing. So let's do a flip. Instead of going into the world of imagination in animation, let's take the world of animation and go into imagination in reality. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's <laughs> That's great. funny. Well, and, and because you assume that the kids who are watching were identifying with the babies in animation, when you went into the real footage, it took them into their own real world as they would imagine it if they were on a flight of fancy. So it just was a win, 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 win. Right. Some of the footage the series used include all the Muppet movies at the time, The Muppet Show, Jim's fantasy films like The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Star Wars thanks to Henson's connection with George Lucas, Gertie the Dinosaur, The Blob, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Ghostbusters, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Howard the Duck, and the weirdest film on the list, Flesh Gordon. No, not Flash Gordon, I mean the 1974 X-rated parody. Don't ask how the babies got an X-rated movie in their imagination. Maybe they found Nanny's secret compartment. See? What'd I tell you? Some of my best friends are monsters! When the show premiered on CBS on September 15th, 1984 with the episode Noisy Neighbors, just around two months after the baby's debut in The Muppets Take Manhattan, it turned out to be a greater success than the feature they came from. The first season was beloved by critics for bringing back some wholesomeness to Saturday mornings, while both the ratings and merchandising immediately placed this as one of the most profitable animated shows of its time. Without hesitation, a second season was ordered, but this time, 
The Muppets became an hour block where the first half showed Muppet Babies and the other presented a new show called Little Muppet Monsters, where it blends animated segments with the Muppets as adults and puppet sketches with new monster characters, Tug, Molly, and Boo, making their own series in their basement on the spot, along with the help of other recognizable Muppets. Unlike the babies, Little Muppet Monsters had a very rough time during its production. Out of the 18 episodes produced, only three of them ever got the chance to be aired, mainly due to the delays and production troubles at Marvel and Toei to get the animated scenes done. Not to mention that they weren't critically well received either, as the cartoon segments were viewed as a massive downgrade compared to the Muppet sketches. Eventually, after presenting those three episodes, Little Muppet Monsters got cancelled and its time slot was replaced with another episode of Muppet Babies, which made things even better for CBS, since that meant that audiences were getting more of the animated Muppet content that they wanted. The expansion was so successful that they grew it again to 90 minutes to have three back-to-back -back Muppet Babies episodes. By Season 3, Howie Mandel left the series, giving his role of Skeeter to Welker and Animal and Bunsen to the newcomer, Dave Coulier. And by Season 4, after its first five episodes, Marvel switched studios to produce the animation for the show from Toei to the Korean-based Acom Productions. Just like with The Muppet Show, once it passed 100 episodes so that it could be considered for syndication, the team figured that it was best to put the series to bed as Muppet Babies go bye-bye on November 2nd, 1991 with the final episode called Eight Flags Over the Nursery. In total, the show ran for 107 episodes throughout eight seasons, and both Henson and Marvel were well rewarded for their great animated work. On top of the millions of dollars it generated regularly on merchandise alone, the series won seven Emmy Awards, four of which were consecutive wins in the category of Outstanding Animated Program. The Babies would make other appearances like in the 1987 holiday special A Muppet Family Christmas, and in 1990, Kermit, Piggy, and Gonzo joined the cast of the crossover anti-drug special Cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue. And while Skeeter was just a Muppet Babies exclusive character, she did reunite with the gang during the family reunion arc of the Muppet Show Boom comics. However, with how they dominated both television and merchandising, the impact of Muppet Babies did not go unnoticed. Many have stated that the series was responsible for the trend of animated shows that turned recognizable cartoon characters into children including Tiny Toons Adventures, technically, Jungle Cubs, The Flintstones Kids, Yo Yogi, Tom and Jerry Kids, a pup named Scooby-Doo. Yeah, Hanna-Barbera was especially guilty of trying to copy Jim. In 2018, Disney brought back the Muppet Babies as a CG reboot show. Developed by Chris Hamilton and codenamed Kids Next Door creator Tom Warburton, this updated series continued the tradition of the original to teach children about using their imagination. But not only did they receive a new computer animated look, but they even featured more baby versions of the Muppets, including a new member to the main cast called Summer, a penguin who loves art. While not the phenomenon in the leagues of its predecessor, it was still a solid hit running for three seasons with 71 episodes going from March of 2018 to February of 2022 and got several Emmy nominations, along with two wins for the voiceover performances of Ben Diskin as Baby Gonzo and Rizzo and of supervising director Matt Danner the following year as Baby Kermit, Rolf, Beaker, Chef, and Waldorf. If there's one thing that the Muppet Babies deliver that is the most cherished, more than any adventure they thought up or any piece of merchandise they put their faces on, it's teaching us about the importance of imagination. And there are very few people who encompass that lesson more than Jim Henson himself. By the mid-1980s, his imagination led his entertainment career to become the most successful that it had ever been. 
He had three widely successful shows that were also merchandising juggernauts like Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock, and Muppet Babies. He was an accredited filmmaker with several movies under his belt and a new big budgeted feature on the way. The Muppets still had their position as an entertainment powerhouse, and there were plenty more worlds to explore and tales to tell in Jim's mind to let out his inner storyteller. However, in the following years, Jim would find himself in a complex labyrinth that would require more than just his imagination to get him out of some tough situations. And by the end of that maze, there awaits for both Jim and the Muppets the happiest place on Earth. <laughs> Welcome to the family! Or so they say. Hey, thanks for watching! Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you had a good time with this part and are now excited for the next. I can say right now that you don't want to miss the next chapter of the Muppets history, as things get very interesting when Jim struggles to find success with his next experiments, and especially when Disney enters the scene. So, until next time, see you later dudes! No, they can improve the whole show if they just change the ending. How? Oh. Put it closer to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs>